Oh, hello. Welcome to Real Time for the Real Life. Hi, I'm Ryan Murphy. Uh, I don't know. This thing was in my hand. I'm not lighting it in the house, but here we are. Looks good, I think. Anyway, here's my review of Thor The Dark World. If you haven't watched this before, if you haven't watched what I do here on this series, I sit here with a cruddy webcam and I talk about uh, movies more in depth than a lot of reviews go. Uh, my That's my goal, is to, ta is to actually kind of dissect the movies, talk about the structure, and uh, and then talk about how they could have been better. And especially when it comes to Marvel movies, my first 23 episodes are all going to be Marvel movies because I think that's something we're all passionate about. And when they're good, we like to celebrate they're good. And when they're bad, I like to think about how they could have been better because these are films that we want to be good. Uh, and here we are talking about another bad one, right? So uh, if you haven't, again, if you haven't been familiar with, if you haven't seen the other videos and you're not familiar with my structure, I sort of talk about uh, the A and the C, which is, you know, uh, the beginning and the end, and wh and where their um, what their plan is, what they what the story is they want to tell. And first of all, is that a story worth telling? Uh, and then talk about the B, the stuff of how they get there. And then I analyze the film through the point of view of a three act structure. Uh, so yeah, that's it. And uh, I talk about the first phase of the of the Marvel Studios, and then of course I talk about how it could have been better. That's that's important because we want yeah because of everything I just said. Anyway, so. First phase of Marvel Studios, very good. Iron Man 2 didn't hit a lot of people the right way, but it was brilliant compared to Iron Man 3. That was, if you didn't see my last review, uh, that was a shock to the system. The fact that they even could make movies that bad. It was really kind of a loss of innocence when it came to Marvel Studios. So we thought we're so great at making movies. And, you know, I pointed out in that review just how absurd it was that any that that that, that film could get made the way it was. Because so much of it is just not good writing so much of it is just not how films are made or how they're supposed to be made or how any sensible person should make a movie it just does not fit so this is not that this is a lackluster film and we'll talk about that i think a lot of people for for a lot of people are just they watch the film and they just sort of went eh. and that's the main that's the main issue with the film is it just did not feel impactful uh but it hit a lot of it hit a lot of the right notes it hit a lot of the right beats so let's talk about the a and the c OK, when you're dealing with sequels, obviously, a lot of people think go deep, go darker because of Empire Strikes Back. But um, I'd say more important is to go deeper, go deeper into the mythology you've introduced. My favorite example of this is the Karate Kid Part 2. Karate Kid, we meet Mr. Miyagi. He and daniel son have some funny adventures. And then Karate Kid Part 2, we actually see we actually go to Japan. We go to his world where he's from. And we see more of his backstory. So go deeper. Even, you know, Empire Strikes Back goes deeper, right? And we find out who Luke's father is. Uh, so, yeah. And with Thor, that's exactly what they do. Uh, these, the, the mythology they've introduced is the Nine Realms. And we want to see more of that. And we do. The first film opened up on a prologue, prologue that introduced us to the villains of that piece, the Frost Giants. The second film opens up on a prologue that, that introduces us to another villain of the Nine Realms, the Dark Elves. And we're actually going to see Thor fight these guys en masse in a way that is actually the climax of the film, not just an action scene of the first part. And, they're go and, they, and they go deeper into the mythology because the prologue actually takes place before the prologue of the first Thor. So, we're, you know, it has Odin's father instead of Odin. So these are a long, uh, uh, you know, someone who they, the Asgardians have known about for a long time. And it goes even further back into their history. Uh, and that's all that all works. And, and that's a good thing. And the fact that we're going to get to see Thor um, fight these guys and that we're going to get to see the rest of the Nine Realms because the film opens with him. That's that's the opening action scene, right? It's an action movie. All those movies have like an opening action scene. And that's the opening action scene of is him somewhere else in the Nine Realms and the fact that there is disquiet in the Nine Realms. So that all works. The other aspect uh, is the love story. The uh, love story between Thor and Jane, and I know this is not the most popular. This is not the most popular aspect of these films. It's not the most popular love story in the MCU because it was underdeveloped in the first film. I don't think people didn't respond to it because it wasn't in its nature good, but rather it was just underdeveloped. And even the director Kenneth Branagh has said that. Uh, and and then they develop it further in this film, but this film was not the was not the most well received. It wasn't the best. And then she wasn't even in the third film. So, you know, it's not Tony and Pepper. It's not the, the grand love story of the MCU. But uh, I, I like it. Unlike some, uh, like Josh said, you know, this chemistry never worked for me. 
So that's somewhere where I differ. I thought the chemistry worked from the beginning. It was underdeveloped, but I was looking forward to seeing it being more developed. And that's something this film actually accomplishes. As far as why I think the chemistry works, I, well, first of all, I think Chris Hemsworth and Natalie Portman just have great, great chemistry as actors. I think they look well together on film, like they, like they, they should be together. But I think what I got out of the first Thor film uh, was that Thor was attracted to Jane because of uh, because of the nature of who she was. He's not a stranger to strong women. Okay, like he has Sif running around with him. She's bashing in heads right next to him. Um, and he, she has the hots for him, and he's never giving her a second glance. So I think what he likes about Jane is she is a strong woman. She's an intelligent woman, and she uses her brains rather than her fists. And I think you see that even in the in the first scene they have together in the diner, where he sort of that that occurs to him. And and so that's where I think is the real genesis. That's the germ, right, of the of the sort of love story, uh, and how they sort of counterbalance each other. And so I like the Thor Jane romance. I actually wish it would have there would have been more of it in the MCU. So that's good. And the fact that she's actually going to be brought to his world, and the if you want her to continue to be a part of the story, you have to make her important to the story, right? She can't just continue to be a passive observer. So that's exactly what they do. They have a MacGuffin, which is, you know, the central object. Look it up. Uh, they have a MacGuffin, and the MacGuffin is inside her. So she has to, it's kind of like Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, which actually, as bad a film as that is, and it is horrendous, the, the basic writing beats of that film are actually very good, I think. So just like that film, uh, the, in order to get that person involved in the story again, you have to put the MacGuffin inside them. And I like the way the film does that. So there's dark elves. We're going deeper into the mythology. Uh, they're, they're after something. It's inside Jane. So Thor has to develop further his um, love story with Jane and go on this adventure together. Um, and so that's all really great. As far as the rest of it, we'll, we'll then, as far as what, what's left, we'll get into that beat by beat. Okay, but that all works very well. Uh, we'll just say this right now. Where it fails is, first of all, they don't really have an A and C in that the Dark Elves don't really have a plot that makes sense. It's really... Like, they, they don't. Like, it's just kind of insane. Um, they want to plunge the universe back in darkness because they hate the light. The, then why do they have eyes that respond to visible light radiation? I mean, why aren't they... I, I, yeah, and then why don't they just not go into light? Why do they have to ruin it for everyone else? It doesn't make a lot of sense, and... Yeah, and then of course let's just let's just call spade a spade. I think this was on everyone's mind the second the this video started playing. Um, when you think of Thor: The Dark World, and you think of complaining about it. I think 90% of people have the same th complaint in mind, and that is the villain is weak. Not just the dark elves or their plot, but the villain himself, Malekith, is a very weak villain. And I always go back to you know one of my one of the icons of uh, of film reviewing, which is Roger Ebert. Roger Ebert would always say. Um, action adventure films live and die on their villain. Look up his reviews, written or the Sis Sis Siskel and Ebert video reviews of any action adventure movie. If he would say, you know, if it's got a great villain, it'll be awesome. If it's got a bad villain, it's not worth your time. He didn't like the first Thor, which was, you know, he didn't get to review this film. Sadly, he, you know, he passed away um, before it came out. But he didn't like the first Thor because he didn't think Loki um was a, was a good villain and that's like the 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 mcu's like yeah for until thanos that was like the mcu's trademark film that was so popular he didn't even like him uh, he may have warmed up to him in avengers which you know i i, I can't recall off, off the top of my head um but uh but yeah even in the so imagine what he would have said about maliki this is this is a lackluster villain and no no, no disrespect intended to christopher eccleston but they just didn't give him much and I mean, this guy kills Thor's mom. I mean, you know, there's a, and that's a well-handled scene, and we'll get to that in a bit. But the purpose of that is to make him more, is to it, it, cr expand the gravitas, create more gravitas, create, you know, more of a sense of dread, and like this is powerful, impactful stuff. And even that doesn't work for this film. So that says a lot about this. They just didn't make him interesting. He just talks in a foreign language, and he doesn't even look very cool. He actually he looks kind of lame with his pads. And But yeah. The other aspect, and then we'll get into the beat by beat here, but these are the two aspects I think that really uh, killed the film, is it's way too lighthearted. It's way too comical. Um, I, I know that Marvel Studios is known for its mirth. It's known for its for having a sense of humor. This film took it a little bit too far. Josh and I talk a lot about uh, Transformer Syndrome, which is when the um, there's too much comedy, A, but also 
it the, there's the comedy's in the wrong place and it kills the the pacing. Now, interestingly enough, I've seen this film twice. I saw it in 2013 and I rewatched it before I did this. The second time, just now when I rewatched it, I was not struck by the by any Transformer syndrome as much as I was the first time because that was my main complaint the first time is this has got to stop. So, okay, fine, Selvig is naked. Okay, now Selvig has no pants. Enough. Um, it didn't bother me as much this time, mostly because I don't think it really interrupted the pacing. Like one of the moments that really got to me the first time was when Selvig has no pants near the end. And I'm like, come on, enough is enough. But this time, okay, fine. It doesn't actually impact the pacing because it doesn't take up any screen time. It's just something that's there. Whereas you look at Transformers, right? That's the main problem is that they're actually eating up screen time with these jokes. Um, it's even the problem in other Marvel movies. That said, it's still too lighthearted. The intern's intern is a stupid thing, has no point. Uh, it should have gone away. And it makes us less able to take the film seriously when it's just kind of a, a comedy. Unless it's, I mean, obviously, like, Guardians of the Galaxy was very much intended to be a comedy, but uh, it doesn't work for this film, okay? And uh, they should have taken out the intern's intern and, and made, tried to make us take it a little bit more seriously. But now we have to go beat by beat, okay? Film opens. Now, there's two plot devices, two aspects of this film. Wow, I shouldn't put my fingers that close. Wow, okay, I'm going to put my fingers down because this crappy webcam is making lightning happen. Um, but there's two aspects that should have been one aspect. Uh, and that is, the first one is the, uh, con the, the, the fact that the Nine Realms are in disarray because of uh, the dark magic that Odin used to bring Thor to Earth in the Avengers, which this is a good plot device because... That was one of the problems with the Avengers is like the end of Thor is like, oh, I can't get back to Earth. The Bifrost is, is broken. And then he just arrives back on Earth. This says there's actually consequences to that. And that's actually going to be the, the, the genesis of our opening action scene, which is good. Like I said, the opening action scene, the fact that it takes place in another one of the nine realms uh, is introducing us into more of that mythology is a good thing. I like the idea that that has uh, that the Thor coming to Earth has consequences and that that's the genesis for our opening action scene that's a good beat however they do not explain why the hell that is why on earth is the wh wh why did using the dark magics to bring thor to earth cause any disarray that's like, kind of like all i say well the, the realms are in disarray he has to quell rebellions why whatever pretty poor writing uh the second aspect is this convergence thing um so the nine realms are these nine like planets that are connected by a series of wormholes. There's a special connection between them in the cosmos. So it's not the most nonsensical thing to say. Every now and then, uh, the wormhole business between them, uh, you know, gets all flustery and you know things start moving in between the worlds. That makes sense. Uh, it's a little bit cheesy to say, well, it happens every thousand years, and this just happens to be one of those thousand years right in between all these other big events that are happening in Thor and in the future films. And this just happens to be happening. Wouldn't it be better? This just blows my mind. I didn't think of this. Uh, wouldn't it be better to have the convergence be a direct consequence of Odin using the dark magics to bring Thor to Earth? What if that's like, yeah, we have the Bifrost to utilize the wormholes. That was destroyed. So the only way we could utilize the, the, the wormhole connection between the, film, between the worlds is to you know, manipulate them in a way that's unnatural. And now because of that, we have all this crazy stuff going on. Would have made perfect sense and would have bridged it and made it all the stuff more connected and made, you know, this made the events of the Avengers and everything more consequential and everything that's happening is a direct consequence of that. They didn't think of it. I don't, it blows my mind. That would have been better. Um, but at any rate, Thor's doing this and then the bad guys happen. And, uh, and again, the bad guys arrive because of the convergence. That's what wakes up the Dark Elves. Again, it would have been better if it was a direct consequence of Loki's machinations, which, you know in the first film and in the Avengers. But, uh, but yeah, I, what I do like is that, again, we go back to Jane becoming a part of it because of the thing gets inside her, but it gets inside her because of what she's doing, which because she is such a good scientist and she, she, she brings this, she actually, she, she comes across it accidentally because she is very good at what she does, but she's only there and being able to be good at what she does in this situation because of Thor, because he arrived and because he changed the, everyone's lives. Like, like Coulson says in the Avengers, you changed Selvig's life. You changed everything around here. Now the way that we're doing science is, is, is bent around the fact that 
we're not alone and that you and your people are out there and, and Jane's trying to find him. And because she's such a brilliant scientist and she's trying to find her boyfriend, uh, she comes across this, which, you know, makes her works for her as a character. It shows off how intelligent she is, but it's also all connected to the plot of the, the, the plot of the whole film series. So I like that. I like the fact, long story short, I like the fact that, that that's how that that's how it happens, that it's because of Jane investigating how to, you know, reconnect with Thor um, that she finds this and she only finds it because she's the best there is. Um, and then she gets it and Thor is not allowed to see Jane. That's why he hasn't seen her as yet. Uh, and then but when she's in trouble because of what she finds, that brings them together. And I really like that. Uh and I love the moment when he actually takes her to Asgard. Um, that's a really cool moment in the film. I think the score really works. I forgot to mention the score. Real quick, I do like the score in this scene, and I do like the score overall. Like it very, very mildly. It is a problem, however, that it's not Patrick Doyle's score from the first Thor. Let's get that out of the way right there. Marvel's main problem with scores is that they just didn't keep reusing the same scores, the same late motifs. Whatever. Um, moving on. The Patrick Doyle score is really good, though. Like, I really wish they would have used that. But um, she gets brought to Asgard. I like when she gets to see his world. She's brought into his world. We also get to see the douchey part of uh, of Odin. We get to see that he is not always in the right. He has his prejudices. He's not super wise. He he doesn't like he doesn't want humans up in his business. Uh, he doesn't want humans in Asgard. And I like that. And then the Dark Elves attack. So obviously that's the end. That's kind of the end of our first act, right? Um, we have this dark moment, which actually is kind of typical. Like the darkest moment should, uh, should usually occur. If you're talking like the science of writing and, you know, how things normally go in most of the movies you watch. And I've talked about this before. There is that dark moment two thirds of the way through the film, right? Uh, and in this case, um, I mean, I guess they still have that beat wise, but like the darkest moment for the characters occurs at pretty much at the end of the first act, I would argue. Um, I would define the end of the first act of this film is when the Dark Elves attack um, and they and they kill Thor's mother. Um, they don't get what they want, which is Jane, and they're forced to retreat. But first of all, this is a big action scene. This is what we've been promised. This is we see Asgard in action. You know, we see the warriors of Asgard fighting the Dark Elves and uh, and that works very well. And there's some really cool stuff in there. And then the Thor's mother dies, and that's very, you know, that's emotional, and that's very well done. The funeral scene is terrific, uh, and all that works out very well. So, but already at this point, we can tell that the villain is not any good. So you can see the positives and the negatives of the film already right here at the end of the first act. It's all there. Like they're hitting the right beats. They're they have some good action. It's just it's just a little bit too lighthearted, and it's not impactful enough, even when Thor's mother is getting killed. But Break into the second act. Now we have what Thor's plot is. He what he wants to do. How he wants to take on the Dark Elves. Uh, and I really like this too. I really like this aspect. I really like the idea that it's a repeat of the plot of the first Thor. The first Thor is literally um, Thor disobeys his father. His father says, "Don't go there." He goes there, and it's wrong. And he has to learn that it was wrong. Right. This film, his dad says, don't go there. He disobeys and he goes there. The only difference is this time he's right and Odin's wrong. And we, the audience, know it. Um, I think that was kind of really cool. And I think that it's really cool watching Thor make that decision because he, again, he realized at the end of Thor that his actions in that film were wrong. That was his journey. And he fully realizes that now. Um, so for him to make basically the same decision again, I think is really cool to watch him make that decision. It's not spoon fed for us. We're not giving, given all this sort of stuff I'm talking about in dialogue, but I think it's easy to interpret that what's going through his mind is that, you know, like, okay, I, I've made this mistake before. If I'm going to do this again, I better really be sure and count on the wisdom I've gained since then, um, that I am doing the right thing. And this time my dad is wrong. Um, I really dug that. I really thought that was kind of a, a cool direction to go. And of course, it teams up with Loki. I mean, we got to get the villain of the first film. Now we got to team up with him, right? That's the plot of a lot of sequels, X2 and some other ones. And it works because Loki is such a popular villain. And here's another uh, way that the film sort of falls flat. 
this is the second act and it's pretty simple. We go, well, we do have another big action scene pretty soon after the last one. We had the Battle of Asgard and then we have Loki and Thor's escape. And again, that's handled very well. That's all very entertaining. Once we get to the dark, the dark world though, and the title of the film is The Dark World, it all happens very fast. They show up, the plot is to lure, um, you know, Malekith and, and have him extract the ether from Jane and then blow it up. Uh, it fails, which is interesting because I just got done talking about how he is right. And yet he still fails, um, and it kind of blows up in his face. But it all works out in the end, at least. Uh, but uh, I just feel like, well, that should have gone on longer. There should have been more to that. But then my point here is to talk about actually delineate how it could have specifically been better, and I kind of got nothing. Because you watch that, it's kind of hard to think how could they have added to that. It just feels like there should be more. And I guess one way to sort of think about how it, there's a possibility of it, of it could have been better is to um think about the fact that if the villain was better if there was more to the villain maybe we see more of his backstory if the writers could think of something that i'm not thinking of they could have used that to flesh it out had a bigger action scene i don't know but i do feel like a, a like like a hollywood writer should be able to think of something uh it just feels a little flat again the villain himself is flat and then the second act is flat which is what's helping us build excitement for the third act and it just doesn't really work but then the third act happens. They go to Earth. I love the line, there's so many shoes in here. That is, to me, one of the best jokes in the MCU. I said the film is a little bit too lighthearted. A lot of the humor doesn't work. That is one line that is the, is just the best. I love it. I love it. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch the movie, I guess. But like, if, you, if, you, if you've seen the movie recently or whatever, or you know what I'm talking about, you know it's a pretty funny line. Um... <laughs> But they, they, they arrive back on Earth, and then that's when it really kind of falls flat. So the villain himself is one reason why the why stuff falls flat. Um, and then the second act, and then the third act. Um, the, the way those are handled, I think, again, the first act is great. The, the battle is great. The escape from Asgard is great uh, in the first part of the second act. But um, those are a few aspects that fall flat in terms of dealing with the villains that make it less make it have less impact. Uh, basically he's given these rods and he's like, well, throw these at them. This is silly. This feels, this is not, does not feel epic. I'm going to throw the rod. I, you can, you probably know what I'm talking about. You know, you probably are with me if you've seen the film recently, at least, uh, that, that, that's something that could have, I feel like I'm stammering a lot here. I apologize, but that is something that could have worked in a way because I feel like a journey that thor has been going on through a lot of the films is learning to use his head and not his fist so for him to have to depend on some you know construct to defeat the bad guy because this is a bad guy maybe he doesn't trust himself to be able to defeat that's a great thing for the film that's a great thing for a sequel because it's a bigger badder villain right or it should have been um that is something that might have worked but even then it would have been cheesy because it's his human constructs we know that humans are not as technically illogically as advanced as the other species out there, but they always seem to have the best technology that scientists are able to think up in a moment. Hashtag Flash TV series. Uh, and in the end, it just all happened too quickly. He's like, oh, there's the bad guy. Let me grab these rods. Choom, choom. And obviously it didn't work. Um, there's aspects of it that work. I like the setting. I like the fact that it's in like, you know, cloudy London and uh some of the action when he's battling the villain, falling through the various wormholes, all that is very good. Uh, I just didn't really work out that well. And as far as Thor's arc, I don't feel like he has much of a character arc. Um, but in the end, he does renounce his kingship and go to Earth. So I guess that's pretty big. Um, so, yeah, that worked out fine. Honestly, the film just, yeah, it should have had a better villain. And some of those aspects, like it should have had uh been less lighthearted should have had a better second act and definitely should have had a better third act they should have thought of something to have him do or maybe even have that character arc where he has to rely less on his fist i don't know uh yeah that's that would have been a great thing you know because to have a villain that he's not sure he can defeat you know loki was not the most intimidating villain for him to be it's his brother you know he knew he could beat him to have a villain that he's not sure he could defeat that he had to rely on something else that might have been interesting but as it is, they just kind of stick the rods in his hand, and he's like, oh, these things, it doesn't work. So that's that's Thor the Dark World. Basically, what I've said didn't work is not anything new. A lot of people have been saying it. Uh, but hopefully, uh, I've talked about what did work, which is actually kind of interesting. We talk about a film I didn't like and talk so long about what did work. There's so many beats in this film that work. Bringing in 
uh, a species from the Nine Realms that is uh, a bigger part of the mythology. Having Jane worked in the way she was worked in, having the first act end with an attack on Asgard that is big and epic, having his mother die at the end of that first act, teaming up with Loki, having a thrilling escape from Asgard, uh, going to going to the villain's world, and then having a bit a big third act in London, uh, you know. And then having Thor and Jane end up together and having him renounce his kingship. All that could have, been a, could have made for an awesome movie. It just wasn't very well executed, which is very surprising because the guys who did a rewrite on the script were Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, who, of course, wrote all three Captain Americas and Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. So I don't know what's up with that. But speaking of them, my next review will be Captain America the Winter Soldier. Looking forward to seeing you then. Thanks a lot, guys.